Hey students, let's talk about solutions and solubility. Please get out your science notebook and let's take some notes. Let's start with the essential question that should be written at the top of your page. How do ionic compounds react in solution? Well, in order to talk about a solution, we need to know what a solution is made out of. Solutions are made out of solvents and solutes. The solvent is the material that dissolves a solute, and the solute is the material that is being dissolved. Think of a solution kind of like a drink mix. We have the solvent, pretty much water, and then the solute would be the drink powder. When you put the powder in the solvent and mix it around, you create a solution. So we're talking about solubility. Solubility is the ability of a substance to dissolve. Now, when we say that a substance can dissolve, we say that it's soluble. If a substance can't dissolve, we say that it is insoluble. Sometimes when you mix things, they become insoluble as well, and they form a precipitate. Now, the word precipitate in this context, in a chemistry context, means solid. Don't get that confused with a similar sounding term, precipitation, which in the rain cycle, or which in the water cycle, means rain. I need you to know some important state symbols. These symbols are usually written next to compounds to designate what state they're in. Now, one state that's special in chemical reactions is aqueous or AQ. That means that the substance is dissolved in water or soluble. S is a solid or it's insoluble. And again, another name for a solid is a precipitate. L is a liquid. Now, in chemistry, usually liquids are water or the things that are doing the dissolving. And then finally, G would represent a gas. Okay, so how do compounds act in a solution? Well, remember, there's two different types of compounds. There's ionic compounds and there's covalent compounds. Ionic compounds are made between metals and nonmetals. And when you put ionic compounds in water, those metals and nonmetals dissolve into their individual cations and anions, or positive and negative charges. By the way, many ionic compounds, another name for them are salts. And we're not just talking about table salt. Table salt is an example of an ionic compound, but many ionic compounds are also called salts. Covalent compounds act a little bit differently when they're dissolved in water. What happens is, is they dissolve, but the whole compound usually stays together. Covalent compounds are made of just nonmetals. So here's a simulation that I want to show you. What we're looking at is an ionic salt dissolved in water. Think like sodium chloride. Well, what's going on? The water molecules are taking those ionic salts and they're ripping apart the cations and anions. And so they're disassociating or dissolving or spreading apart in the water. So ionic compounds break apart into their anions and cations. This type of solution, by the way, is typically called an electrolyte. You might be familiar with the term electrolyte in like Gatorade or sports drinks. These are solutions that are electrically conducting. And the reason that they can conduct electricity so well is because there's positive and negative charges floating around in there. These types of solutions are important to our body because they balance fluids. They maintain blood pressure and proper P blood's proper pH, I mean, and they carry electrical signals. Our body is just a bunch of electrical signals and it needs a medium to go through. So maintaining the electrolytes in our body through proper consumption of food and proper nutrition is important. Let's take a look at covalent compounds. Here's another simulation. We said that covalent compounds dissolve, but they typically stay as whole compounds. Here you can see sucrose or sugar. Think of like a sugar cube being thrown in a water. Now the sugar particles will break apart, but not down to their individual atoms. They're gonna stay as whole sugar compounds. We're gonna focus mostly on the ionic compounds dissolved in water. And so just to reiterate what just went on, here's two examples of substances. Here at the top, we have two white ionic compounds. They're two different salts. Now, if we were to look at the molecular level of these, this is what it might look like. These are solid particles. They're really close together and they're made of cations and anions or metals and nonmetals, a bunch of them stuck together. Now, what if we took those salts and we dissolve them in beakers of water? So I've got two beakers of water. We're going to dissolve them. This is what's going to happen at the molecular level. Those salts are going to break apart into their individual cations and anions and be floating around. These are electrolyte solutions. We change the face symbol to be a aqueous or AQ. Now, why are we doing this? The whole point is because we want to show what happens when we mix these. We're going to take these two beakers and we're going to put them together. We're going to mix the solutions and we're going to cause a reaction. And that reaction is, might look something like this. 
really cool solid substances formed. If we were to look at the molecular level, this is what it might look like. Notice that the blue molecules in one beaker mixed with the purple molecules in a different beaker and created an insoluble precipitate or a solid substance. Now the the red molecules and the orange molecules also kind of mixed, but they could remain soluble or dissolved in water. Well, how do we know that what's going on here? Well, this is called a double replacement reaction. Here's a simplified version of what we just saw on the last page. We're just focusing on two different compounds at a time. Our first compound is AB and it's aqueous. And our second compound is CD and it's also aqueous. And if we mix them, right, designated by this little plus symbol here, they go through a reaction and they're going to exchange partners. A is going to go with D or positive and negative is going to meet up and C is going to go with B, another positive and negative are going to meet up. So ions in two different compounds will exchange places in an aqueous solution and they're formed two new compounds. Some of those compounds will remain soluble and some of them will become insoluble. So how do we know whether something's going to be soluble or insoluble when they do these reactions? Well, we use something called solubility rules. These are found on the back of your periodic table, and I want to teach you how to use it. The important part of solubility rules is the left side right here. This is the, the main part of the rule. It's the if-then statement. The top part here has a bunch of compounds, or sorry, a bunch of uh, anions. If you see these anions in a solution or in a compound, then that compound will be soluble. And we're talking about the products. And we designate soluble with AQ. Now, sometimes there's exceptions. If you ever see any of these attached to these to these anions, any of these cations attached to these anions, then the, the states flip and it becomes insoluble. Similarly, down here, if you see any of these anions, then this product is insoluble, or again, we say it's a precipitate when we put a little symbol of an S. Unless they're attached to these guys over here, then they become aqueous or soluble. So let's take a look at some examples. Let's say we went through and we mixed some things together and one of the products of a reaction was KNO3. Well, I see NO3 right here. So this should be soluble. And it is because there's no exceptions. It doesn't matter what NO3 is attached to. And in this case, it's attached to potassium. All right, how about AGCl? So I see Cl up here as well. So this should be soluble. But if you look here, AG is an exception. So because chlorine is attached to silver, it flips it and it becomes insoluble. CAS, so here's calcium and sulfur. So I see sulfur down here. It should be insoluble, right? It should be an S. But notice that it's attached to CA and that's one of the exceptions. So it flips it over and becomes aqueous. All right, here's calcium carbonate. Oh, I see carbonate is right here. So it should be insoluble. Calcium is not one of the exceptions, so it's going to remain insoluble. So let's actually do this. Let's put everything together and try to figure out a, a chemical reaction, a double replacement reaction, and solubility. This is kind of the main climax of the slide, so pay close attention to this so we can tie everything together. So here we have two ionic compounds, and we dissolve them in water. Notice that they both say aqueous, and we're going to have them go through um, a, a mixture. We're going to mix them together and see if they create a reaction. We're going to see if they follow those solubility rules. Now, in order to do that, we need to understand that this is the double replacement reaction. Remember, AB, compound AB, that's lead to nitrate, compound CD, that's potassium iodide, will mix, and A is going to go with D, and C is going to go with B. But how do they do that? Well, remember, these are ionic compounds, so we have to pay attention to their charges. Lead, in this case, is a positive 2 charge, because I, and I know that because nitrate is a negative 1 on the periodic table, and there's two of them. Here's potassium and iodine. There's one potassium with a positive 1 charge and one iodine with a negative 1 charge. Now, A is going to go mix, or lead is going to go mix with iodine. So our positive 2 is going to go mix with negative 1. Do you know how many we would need of each? Well, we need one lead and two iodines in order to make a new compound with this double replacement reaction. All right, next, potassium is going to go with nitrate. Well, potassium is a plus one and nitrate is a minus one, so we only need one potassium and one nitrate. So that's what happens in a solution when we mix these two compounds. 
Now, the last part of this is, can we tell what the solubility is? Are these things soluble? Did they dissolve? Did they stay dissolved? Or are they insoluble? Do they react and form a really cool looking precipitate? Well, let's use the solubility rules to do that. Our first compound, PBI2, I see I right here and it is soluble. Except lead, PB, is an exception, so that makes it insoluble. So PBI2 is an insoluble precipitate. It formed a solid. How about KNO3? Well, NO3 up here is soluble, and there's no exceptions. It doesn't matter what's attached to. So KNO3 is aqueous. If you can understand this, then you're doing really good. In fact, here's a practice for you. I really recommend you pause the video and see if you can figure out how these two ionic salts re, uh, mix together in solution, figure out what their products are and whether they're soluble or insoluble. See if you can pause the video right now to figure that out. Did you pause the video? I hope so. Let's try it out. Well, remember, our double replacement reaction, we have two compounds and they're gonna switch places with each other. A is gonna go with D and C is gonna go with B. So the positive, the cations, always gonna meet with a different anion. So here, FES and NaOH are going to meet up. Well, the two products are going to be FeOH2 and Na2S. The reason for that is because over here, iron is a plus two charge. It's still a plus two charge over here. Sulfur over here is a negative two charge, and over here it's still a negative two. And so if we follow along with that, if this is a plus two and this is a negative two, those keep their charges. Now here, sodium is a plus one, so it still has to be a plus one over here. And hydroxide, this polyatomic ion, is a minus one, so it's still a minus one over here. So this is why FeOH, and there's a little two right there, because we need two hydroxides to counteract the iron. Over here, we need two sodiums to counteract the one sulfur. And so that is our two products of this double replacement reaction or this mixture when we mix these two chemicals together in a solution. This is how they're gonna find new partners. All right, how about solubility? What's the solubility of these two products? Well, we need to figure out what they are. By the way, over here, these two things are aqueous. We don't have to worry about using solubility rules for the reactants because they haven't gone through a reaction. They're just salts dissolved in water. But over here, we have to use solubility rules to figure out what the products are. Now, in the first case, iron to hydroxide is going to be insoluble because hydroxide is an insoluble product and iron is not one of the exceptions. Over here, sodium sulfide, I see sulfur down here and sodium is an exception. So this should have been insoluble, but because it's attached to sodium, it flips it over and becomes soluble. All right, that leads us to the end of our notes. Go ahead and take a moment and review and highlight the key terms. Ponder and ask some questions, summarize, and answer the essential question on your page. Good luck.